sit down. Can I have you pick up doctor, please? Hey, if there's dust in it, God's in the dust, too. So, I mean. And we're not even going to go over that story of Washington and Abraham Lincoln talking. But we have 30 minutes, and I've come prepared with a notebook and notes, so we're all in trouble, right? No, but we've been talking about uh, becoming a Pentecostal powerhouse. What do we mean by that? Well, I'm, we all know what I mean by that. But just to reiterate, is somebody who goes to the gym, we're basing the upon somebody who goes to the gym, who works out, who's trying to get in shape. And while they do that in the physical, we can do the same thing in the spiritual. Now, we may not go to the gym and physically lift weights to become a better prayer warrior, or we might not go to the Golden Corral to become a better pastor. But the concept is that if we're going to become a Pentecostal powerhouse, somebody who's mighty in the things of God, then it, we're going to have to work at it. It's going to take practice. We talked about the importance of faith. And what is the enemy of faith? Doubt. We looked at the Word of God. The Word of God clearly states that doubt is the enemy of faith. We love to use the illustration and the account of Jesus coming out of the wilderness and talk about uh, spiritual warfare and demons and talk about how there are some that don't come out but by prayer and fast. Well, that's absolutely true. But if we step back before Jesus rebuked the disciples and said that this kind don't come out by prayer and fasting, there, what's the reason he rebuked them for and said the demon didn't come out? Because you doubted. And then he went on to explain. From faith, we jump to prayer. Because prayer is the un most unutilized weapon in the Christian arsenal. People do not know what it is to really pray anymore. And all honesty, we probably if we pray over our food, not a times out of ten unless we make a conscious effort, we're just going through the motions. God bless us, let's buy you. Amen. And we don't take into account the seriousness of it. I'm getting ready for this morning, so I'm not there in my notes, but I can't remember who it said it was, but they said it, I think it might have been Ravenhill, a man who is intimate with God will not be intimidated by man. What is that? That is a person who knows what it is to pray, who gets closer to God. From prayer, we couple it with fasting. If you really want to see God move in a situation, then we'll fast. Why do we fast? Because we are putting down our self, not as a bad self, don't do that again but putting this down, suppressing our will to take on the will and seek the will of the Father. It is sacrifice. It is showing God our dedication to that situation. God, I need you to move in this situation. It shows Him our seriousness, our earnestness to see Him move in ways that we can never dream or imagine. We used examples from the past. We talked about John Knox. Who married Queen of Scots said, I fear the, art, uh, the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies in England. Yes, she feared the prayers of John Knox, but what does that tell us? That more than likely he was not just a man who knew what it was to pray, but he knew he was a man who knew what it was to fast, to get a hold of God. Moving on today. And I'm part of the back of my notes than I thought. But last week we began talking about the armor. And what's one thing we know about our armor from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4? 2 Corinthians 10 4. What is one thing that we know? So the weapons of our warfare are what? They're not carnal. What does that mean? They're not fleshly. They're not tangible. It's not me whipping out a sword and saying this is literally the sword of God. They're not carnal. They're not fleshly. But they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds nonetheless. What does Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, uh, I'm sorry, 11 and 12 state. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. And we're going to be focusing on these two verses for the remainder of Sunday school. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. So we are commanded to put on the armor of God. How much of the armor are we commanded to put on? All of it. The day and age in which we're living, that is not a popular gospel. We are to put on the whole armor of God. All of it. That's like going into a church that believes the Bible and God and saying we need to put on the whole word of God and go by it. We are living in a day and age where there are lots of preachers, lots of teachers, and lots of churches that are picking and choosing what parts of the Bible they want to believe and what parts they don't want to believe. They are picking and choosing whether or not heaven's good is, exists, but hell doesn't exist because we don't want to have to go someplace bad. Or we want to have all the good things of God, but we don't want to do the work of it. You know, we, and sometimes we're guilty of this too. We expect million dollar answers from 10 cent prayers. When we have not paid the price, when we have not found our place in prayer and showed God our earnestness and need for it and how badly we need to see him move in a situation. But we are living in a day and age where they don't want the whole gospel. They only want to pick and choose. I mean, we could probably not have to travel far and we'll find a church that um, might say it's all right to drink homosexuality is all right. I mean, we have to adapt with the times. Or They might start having secular dances in the church to get the young people involved. And they're trying to win the world through worldly means. The full gospel of Jesus Christ is not a popular message in the day and age in which we're living in. But we don't get to pick and choose. We need to take the whole Bible. When it comes to Judgment Day, God's not going to judge you on what you picked and what you liked and what you didn't like. He's going to judge you by everything. And when it comes to the armor, we don't get to pick and choose which pieces we want. And really, if we did, we are vulnerable Christians. And I mean very vulnerable Christians. What do I mean by that? Why do we have to put on armor in the first place? What's armor used for? Protection. Protection. Protection from whom? Protection from that person who loves you so much and would do anything from you? Yeah. It's from your enemies. It's from the devil. Modern warfare. They didn't put on breastplates of um, leather and uh, metal and chain mail so that when you got jabbed in the short, um, unseen, when you got jabbed in the short, small open areas that you didn't bleed. They didn't put it on for fun to giggles. They didn't go out and play tag in their armor. They put it on for protection. We put our armor on for protection. Why? Because we have an enemy. Is that anything new and revolutionary? No, it's not revolutionary. It's nothing new. But we have an enemy. We found that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we don't have just one enemy, but we have several enemies. He said, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, there's one, against powers, there's two, against rulers of the darkness of this world, that's three, spiritual wickedness in high places, that's four. So we have an enemy. What does Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 state? Colossians 1, 16. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Do those sound like anything that were just mentioned in this verse? God is saying that he created everything. And 
we have an enemy. Probably the most famous enemy that we have is found in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Ephesians 2 and verse 2. Okay. Let me get my nice little drawing out. Okay. So, who's our enemy there? What's the title given to him? Past. What's that? Time's past. Not time's past. What did you just ask? <laughs> the enemy listed. What's his title? Oh, title. I thought you said time. No, not time. Prince in the power of the air. Here on this nice clean board, we have a perfect circle. If you don't think it's perfect, then we need to pray for you today. And this perfect circle, you want to take a guess what it represents? This could be anything I've seen. This is going to represent all eternity, and that's going to represent now. No, that's not going to represent now. This here is earth. It is earth. This physical earth. It's the world. It's perfectly round, right? Thank you, brother. I have one on my side. <laughs> but this represents the earth. Now, we have an enemy. He's what? What's the title given? Oh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, brother. I'm trying to display a nice little picture here. But from this verse, he's the prince of the power of the air. The Greek word for air in the Bible, not the King James B, because that's in English, but the Greek word that I was translated there was taken from the Greek word aero, A-E-R, I think. Oh, somebody's going to write that up. Yeah, A-E-R, aero. And when we look into the word aero, it means this, breathable air. Breathe boy. Remember when we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and we can study through the Bible how there's different heavens, the heaven and the air, heaven and the sky where the stars are, and heaven where God resides. This is air. So we get that he's not just the prince of the power of the air all the way up into space, but arrow. So he's into breathable air. Let me turn this this way now. So we have the devil who is we'll call breathable. Because we all know that you can go so far into the atmosphere, and you can't breathe anymore. The air is too thick. So this is breathable air. So if that's Earth, he's the prince of the power of the air. Now, what do we know about demons? If we know, do a study on demonology, we know that hell is in the middle of the Earth, with that nice little round circle that connects that all the points, and goes on forever. There are angels that are chained in hell. For other crimes, we get that from Jude 1, 6, and 2 Peter 2, 4. We know that somewhere on Earth, there's a bottomless pit. We'll call it a BP. No, it is not British Petroleum. It is bottomless pit. We get that from Revelation 9, 1 through 11. They have a leader, a demon, a bad enemy. Napoleon, whatever you want to call it. If you want to be Hebrew, call him bad. And if you want to be Greek, call him Napoleon. I don't care which one you choose. We're grafted in, so we'll call him a bad. So we know that these are down here. They're not doing anything, but they are there. These will be released later in life, but not now, during the tribulation period. So right now we're dealing with breathable air. The devil's there. And if we come back to... Ephesians chapter 6 that we've just taken from, verse 12. If we look at this, Paul gives us, basically he's laying out the hierarchy of the demonology world. When it comes to the devil's setup, well, let me back up. Do we have hierarchies in this world? Do we have systems? Absolutely. Who's the head of the United States? The president. Who's next, next in charge? Vice president. Then there's the cabinet, and then it goes down, down, down. If we break it down into a church level, you have the pastor, you have the council, you have the Sunday school teacher, and then you have the lay members. Where did we get all that from? We get that from God. God has a hierarchical system 
for the angels in heaven. We know that there are archangels, which are being translated, does anybody remember? Whoa, 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 whoa. Chief angel. When we get into this system, that's exactly what we're seeing here. The devil is doing exactly what he does with everything else. He is stealing God's system. So he has it listed out. And the very first thing he lists is principalities. And when we look at principalities, I'm trying to find my notes here. I said I don't have a lot of notes, but I know what I'm talking about. But when we look at principalities, we have the layout of the, of the chief system here. And when we study principalities, But principalities mean exactly this, chief angels. When you look at somebody in charge, does he do everything that needs to be done? No. It's not possible. I say it's not humanly possible, but it's also not humanly spirit um, possible or angelically is possible. They delegate it. Yes. Exactly, but if he's in charge, if you're in charge of something, sometimes you have people under you. If you say Michael, he would uh, like a battle angel. Exactly, they have turned. Gabriel, he was more like a messenger. Messenger, even though he did fight too. But they were chief angels in heaven. When we look at the devil's kingdom, the principalities are chief angels. That's exactly what they are. So they are the ones over them. I'm not saying they're the highest, but to a degree, they are. Uh, when you study it out with the word principalities, the word used there actually means chief. Then we have powers. And they are the ones that del are delegated to.
Yes. When you look at your King James Version at the bottom, in verse 12, the very fast last phrase is spiritual wickedness in high places. See how that word is italicized. Ephesians 6, 12. I'm sorry. Ephesians 6 and 12. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Notice the last word, places. See how why it italic italicized. Italicized being slightly slanted over. It's not like the other print. When we start studying the history of the King James Version, and this is why we adhere to the King James, old King James, and not any others, because they were so meticulous in the translation that they want to make sure that they were not perverting the word of God in any way. But in the original Greek, that word places was not there. They added it to give us a better understanding. Anytime they added a word to give us a better understanding, to complete the phrase, they italicized it to prove to the reader that it was added and to show that it was added. And they, so they would be taken off course. But when we look at the Greek phrase there, for spiritual wickedness in high places, we find that it is actually the Greek word eporanus, E-P-O-R-A-N-I-O-S. And what that means is this, above the sky are celestial. So we have breathable air around the earth, and we have thrown the dominions higher than that, but spiritual wickedness in high places, spiritual wickedness each place. There are anywhere between the breathable air and wherever heaven begins. We just know it's somewhere between there. So when we look at the earth, the thrones of the enemy are all around it. From outer space where the stars are to the air that we breathe, the enemy's around us. And we're coming to a point. In Revelation chapter 17, I want to say, we know that there are three spirits that go out. Three frog-like spirits. Those are demons. We know that there are three other demons oh, mentioned in one of the smaller apostles. Lust of the eye. Lust of the flesh, pride of life. So we have demons walking around the earth. We didn't know that. There's a lust demon. I think it was Lester Summerall I was reading after. It's been many, many moons, and I've only ever found this phrase one time. But the author made the statement that when you look at an idol, the reason the idol looks the way it does is because some demon revealed itself to an artist many centuries ago, whenever it was first created. And that's how the artist saw the demon and was portrayed. Now, if we get into demonology a little bit, you realize that if we trace the gods present to way back then, that they look exactly the same. What do I mean by that? If I mention Poseidon, you all should probably have a vivid image of what I'm talking about. What does Poseidon supposedly look like? Is he completely fish? When your average person thinks of Poseidon, thinks part fish, part man. Top half man, bottom half fish. If we would move on to the future. The Romans stole that god, called him Neptune. You realize that we can trace him all the way back in the Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 5? In the temple of Dagon? And what did Dagon look like? Half man, half fish. The gods don't change because that's the demon. The demon actually exists, so the god never changed. That's exactly what he looked like. If we go back to Roman, uh, or even Greek mythology, 
there's 12 main gods. So now we've got at least 12 main god, uh, demons on the earth. Or I should say 12 other demons now roaming the earth. If we get into Hinduism, there are more gods than there are people. So now we have multiple demons running to and fro on the earth. Just because we don't see them don't mean that they don't exist. Demons are around us all the time. The witch at Endor, what did she bring up? A familiar spirit. Why are they called familiar spirits? Because they're familiar with that person that they were following. That's who they were following, and they know them. They know what they liked, what they didn't like, what they did. Demon. So we step back, you realize demons know what you like, what you don't like, where you go, what you do, what you do in public, what you do in private, what you do that no one else knows. They are familiar with you. So why do we need the armor? Because there are demons everywhere. And they are constantly under attack. And they are constantly attacking us. Now we're not just up there just for the shield. A shield isn't going to protect you from everything. A shield's not... Why do they put on the whole armor all the way around them in, uh, in war times? Why does it go all the way around, not just in the front? Because you're not always being attacked from the front. Sometimes you're being attacked from the sides. Sometimes you're being attacked from behind. Sometimes you're being attacked from underneath. Sometimes you're being attacked over top. And sometimes you're being attacked from all the sides at one time. Why do we need to put on all the armor of God? Because there are demons that are out to take us down every opportunity that they can. The Bible states that the devil, he is a schemer. We find that in chapter 6 and, um, of Ephesians and verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles translated into the original language, which literally means trickery, deceit. How do you catch a mouse? You put a trap out, but what do you put on the trap? You put bait. I mean, personally, I don't use cheese. I use peanut butter. Because it seems that they like it a little bit better. So when cheese is not going to work on you, the devil's going to put peanut butter out there. He's going to put out what's out there to lure you. He's going to put a trap out there to trick you, to deceive you. He is a schemer and a plotter. And he waits for you. We get that from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. If someone would please read that. 1 Peter 5, 8. He's walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But what's he doing? He's waiting. He's lying in wait. He's looking to see whom he may devour. If you're going to go against somebody, and you so let's say you want to devour, if, if you're hunting, I could probably ask Pat how many deer he jumped out in front of him with the gun pointed directly at his head and said, I'm here to take you hostage and kill you and eat you. And they all were just there blanking and said, okay, that sounds good to us. We'll jump right in the freezer in the back. We'll even gun ourselves. It doesn't happen. You have to wait. And you have to wait for them to come. The devil lies in wait to see what's going to work on each one of us to take us down because everyone's different. Everyone has different weaknesses. And he's seeking whom he may, may devour. He's watching. He's waiting. If you're trapping something, you might put one bait out one time, and it's not effective. So what do you do? You lie in wait. You check it out. Okay, well, let's try this bait. 
Ever talk to a fisherman?